Great. Thank you, Martina. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Patty Enrado, Senior Director of Client Content Development at HIMSS, and I'm with Leah Sims, Marketing Strategy Lead, Healthcare and Life Sciences at Verizon. Welcome, Leah. Yeah, thanks so much for having us here. Uh, happy to support and um, looking forward to jumping in today's uh, content. Great. So whether healthcare providers offered telehealth to their patients or not before 2020, COVID-19 forced many providers to rapidly stand up telehealth platforms or ramp up their telehealth services. So one year later, as we slowly but surely transition to the next phase of the pandemic, and that's with people getting vaccinated, providers are assessing the performance of their telehealth platforms and services and determining how to improve upon them as part of their continuing offerings. So HIMS conducted research in November 2020 on the future of telehealth around post-pandemic expectations. So today we're going to look at those findings that identify the challenges providers faced in standing up their telehealth programs and best practices for continuing to deliver telehealth in a post-pandemic world so that your healthcare organization can develop strategies going forward. And at the end of our review of the research, Daniel Preisler Senior Product Manager at Blue Jeans by Verizon will discuss how Blue Jeans by Verizon is using these insights to develop the concepts around its new telehealth offerings. So let's spend a moment on the research re overview. So HIMSS Market Intelligence conducted this research during November 2020 on behalf of Blue Jeans by Verizon, and the research was conducted to understand how clinicians and hospital leaders are approaching telehealth, specifically focused around expectations for the post-pandemic future of telehealth, platform use and needs among clinicians and telehealth decision makers, and challenges and areas of opportunity for post-pandemic telehealth. So this research was conducted among clinicians and key telehealth decision makers at U.S. hospitals and health systems, and a total of 103 qualified respondents answered the survey. To qualify, respondents had to be a clinician at a U.S. hospital or health system or have a decision-making role about telehealth and work in a leadership, administration, or IT tech role at a U.S. hospital or health system. So 51% of respondents work for an IDN or multi-hospital system, and 82% of respondents' healthcare organization had 2,499 beds or less. What's interesting to note about the respondent profile is that regardless of job level or job role, all non-clinicians have a role in decision-making process for telehealth. And 45% of those that stated that they use the solution but have no involvement in the purchase decision are all clinicians. So, Leah, I want to pause here and ask you a question, you know, um, at this point. Does it make sense for the users to have a say in purchase decisions? You know, and what's lost when the users don't have a say? Um, and then what's gained when they do have a say in purchase decisions? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think in any industry when you're looking at um, – you know, adopting and integrating uh, platforms and tools uh, for your um, for your employees, for your teams, and in this case, for your clinical teams that they're going to have to use every day. It's really critical to get their feedback around you know how those capabilities and tools can map um, seamlessly to their workflows. The last thing. Uh, clinicians need is more disruptive technology. They really need uh, platforms and solutions that are intuitive to the way they want to work, to the way they want to communicate with um, and provide care for their patients, the way they want to document that care, uh, the way they want to work in coordination with other care collaborators and um, specialists to provide the best care that they can. So I think when you know technology adoption decisions are made, uh, in the C-suite, or they're made with only um, one half of, uh, of your organization in mind. So let's say, you know, it's the IT team or, or the technology teams that are really making those decisions, but they're not pulling in um, clinical teams and those that are patient-facing uh, and having to use those tools to provide care. Um, there's often a mismatch of expectations and a lot of frustration down the road. But if you can align those two halves of the organization, both operation 
and frontline uh, care provision and experience together um, and, and look for platforms and, and, and technologies and capabilities that make sense for the organization from a technology roadmap perspective and an infrastructure transformation perspective, but also will be used and adopted by um, the teams within your organization who are going to deliver the ROI on, on that investment um, down, down the road. Um, it's really important to get them engaged up front. So, yeah, I think it's critical, and I think this data um, proves that out. Um, that, that users have to be involved in the discussion uh, and really weighing in on what they need and what's going to really make a difference uh, and return that ROI for executives and decision makers. Great. So through our research, we determined that there are three key traits that can help healthcare providers as they look to continue building out their telehealth offerings in a post-pandemic world. And that's that the technology needs to be user-friendly, there's an element of patient centricity that's really important. And of course, interoperability, the ability to connect patient and provider. So let's take a deep dive now with the detailed findings and how those research findings can support the next phase of your telehealth strategy. So telehealth, telehealth had to be stood up rapidly. So it's not a surprise that one third of respondents agree that their current telehealth technology is too difficult for patients to use. And only 28% agree that current telehealth technology is not difficult to use. When we look at the same finding, but from a different uh, job role perspective, executive leaders are more likely than IT tech decision makers and clinicians to view current telehealth technology as too difficult. We asked respondents to rank the top five factors out of 11 that they believe drive good outcomes from telehealth visits. So not surprisingly, ease of use for both patients and physicians was the runaway winner. Um, patient access to technology is also critical, and that highlights the digital divide. So it's incumbent on the provider to be able to connect with their patients. There's also an interoperability play here that healthcare providers need to pay attention to. And then patient participation engagement in the telehealth visit ranked third. So this is important because if you're thinking about patient outcomes and patient satisfaction from a revenue and quality initiative perspective and you aren't seeing your patients in person, you really need the telehealth experience to engage and enable the patient to participate, you know, that there are no barriers that impede communication between patient and provider. So, Leah, let's pause for a moment and talk about these top five factors. So, for healthcare providers who are evaluating their current telehealth services and technology, how can this knowledge guide them? Yeah, I think it's very revealing, certainly confirming of uh, research that we've done at Verizon on the patient side uh, through our Verizon Media Group. We, we saw similar results from patients about uh, frustrations with the technology through COVID and, and, and getting used to the technical um, complexity of, of getting onto their telehealth visits. And certainly there are some digital divide issues to address there as well. Uh, but this certainly confirms that patient experience should be top of mind when uh, hospitals and health systems and providers are thinking about not only um, fine-tuning and augmenting the telehealth programs they're already rolling out, but any considerations for future adoption, you know, interestingly, if you look to the far right of this data, you know, this is where you're seeing some of that interoperability priority. I mean, they, they want to be able to document, um, you know, there's, there's some numbers there related to the things they'd like to see with patient checkout and pass off points and, and those kind of things, but nothing um, speaks louder than those first four columns <laughs> around how important it's, it, it is um, for these telehealth platforms to be very user-friendly, um, to be intuitive to uh, and supportive of a really meaningful dialogue between the physician or clinical team member and their patient. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, the, the, the challenge of virtual care is that there's the potential to lose that relational connection with your patient. Uh, and so it's really important that that telehealth experience put the, the physician uh, in the room with the patient as much as possible and eliminate any barriers to them getting in, feeling comfortable in, in, the, um, you know, in the encounter, and then being able to seamlessly 
uh, get out of it and check out well. And so I think those are some strong considerations. And I also think that from an executive level, if you're looking at um, <laughs> press gainy and HCAP scores and you're really focused on overall patient satisfaction across every touch point within your hospital or health system or across your organizational brand, it, it, it's now even more important that you're thinking about those digital front doors or those digital doorways that you're connecting with your patient, whether that's website, scheduling, et cetera. And now telehealth, of course, is a critical piece of that. Again, not only to sustain patient relationship with their physician and to make sure um, you know care moves forward along the continuum that it needs to, but also because it really matters to those organizations that that patient um, has a satisfying experience that will continue to keep them um, coming back through that doorway and staying connected to that health system and not necessarily looking elsewhere for their care services and support. Great. So ease, of technolo technological, so ease of technological use is also a key factor in driving good outcomes from telehealth. So when we look at the breakout of job roles, you'll see that individuals with executive administrative roles are more likely to rank ease of technological use than clinicians. So our research found that a majority of decision makers expect their telehealth video conferencing budget to increase in the next two to three years at 81%. So 20% are either staying the same or decreasing their budget. So Leah, should the 20% who are either staying the same or decreasing their budget be concerned that 80% of their peers are increasing their telehealth video conferencing budget? So is there an element of FOMO, fear of missing out here? There could be. There very well could be. I think at the very least they need to be watchful of what the rest of the industry is doing and the way telehealth is moving from, you know, sort of an outline uh, perimeter offering um, to really a virtual first offering for especially primary care. Um, so some of this number, the 20% number, and it's hard to know without double-clicking down on it, but there could be reasons why uh, those folks are, are, are being watchful. They're not increasing their budget um, or maybe decreasing it moving forward. It may have to do with their specialty type or the kind of specialized care that they're providing to their patients that doesn't lend itself well to a telehealth visit. It could be that they're keeping an eye on, on um, reimbursement. Uh, discussions and decisions that we're all still watching right now. You know, we, ne we need to see some reimbursement parity between on-site visits and telehealth visits so that there's a real ROI for clinical practices to move more strongly in this direction. So some of that could just be watchfulness, and some of it could really be tied to uh, having use cases that don't lend themselves well to uh, virtual care or a telehealth visit. But I think the rest of those numbers certainly do point to an industry that uh, through the acceleration of telehealth utilization we've seen in the last year, um, believe that it's here to stay, are making a, a, a significant commitment to land and expand, so to speak, with those capabilities. And I think um, they're certainly seeing support on the patient side for the convenience and the ease of use, um, you know, and, and, and also risk management and contactless care that we're all being mindful of moving forward. I think it's a strong trend and the 20% should definitely keep their eye on it. Mm -hmm. Great. So according to our research, respondents expect two thirds of their telehealth visits post pandemic to be for sick or needs-based visits. So Leah, if this is the forward direction, how should healthcare providers prepare for these types of visits, sick and needs-based visits, when they're re-envisioning or bolstering their telehealth offerings? So is there any pivoting from what they're doing now, and how does user-friendliness, patient-centricity, and interoperability play into this? Yeah, I have to say that I think this statistic more than any um, in the survey was a bit of a surprise to us uh, when we got this data back. I think there was a lot of assumption, not just on our part, but others uh, in the industry that, you know, coming out of COVID and the necessity of telehealth for those, um, you know, low acute uh, general routine care visits that we saw sustained during COVID, you know, we kind of assumed coming out of that, that telehealth would lend itself best to those kind of visits that um, are quick check-ins or medication refills or things that required the least amount of hands-on physical examination or patient assessment. Um, but what we're seeing in this um, result 
is that um, clinicians are actually thinking, you know, the, the, the flip of that. They're, they're thinking that um, sick visits with the right um, integration of potentially remote patient monitoring uh, tools to uh, examine patients in, in, in a sick visit might be a better use of telehealth, um, not only to keep those uh, patients at home um, out of contact with other patients in the office or in the clinic, uh, but also for convenience reasons that may be where we see that direction. I certainly don't think that means we're not going to also see um, utilization of telehealth for um, checkups, but maybe annual visits where there's a whole lot more physical examination and assessment. Those are things they're probably going to still bring a patient into the office to do. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be said for uh, the thinking around sick visits as a forward-moving model. And if I were, um, you know, looking at that from the clinician side, I'd have to be looking at the remote patient monitoring space. What kind of assessment would I be comfortable with? Um, for a, a patient at home who does have a chief complaint or a sickness or um, an, an illness that needs evaluation, how can I do that remotely um, at the same level of, um, you know, quality of care and inspection and examination? I'm going to rely on, um, you know, in, in some of those cases probably on RPM data, and those are certainly things we're exploring. But I think there's a lot to be said about the direction of telehealth to be uh, an, an interventional care option as opposed to just the way we've been thinking about it historically for the most low acute check-ins um, and low level uh, type of, uh, of visits. I also think it's going to lend itself well to supporting the critical shortage we'll see with primary care uh, as a practice moving forward. I think we're all aware of you know, the need for technology automation in some cases and telehealth and, and virtual care in others to help support and fill gaps in the growing shortage of clinicians in that primary care space. And, and, and this certainly does seem to indicate that even with sick visits, there'll be a, a telehealth use case to support that and take some of that load off of primary care having to take care of those patients in office. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So post-pandemic, decision makers expect nearly half of their organization's telehealth visits to be with a generalist versus a specialist at 33% and a non-clinician at 22%. So Leah, how does this expectation shape healthcare providers' telehealth strategy? How does it impact service offering um, you know, and or their telehealth uh, platform? Yeah, I, I don't think this st these statistics are surprising, again, when you look at the previous slide and combine that, you know, those insights around sick visits and checkups with this slide, um, what we know to be true is that the more specialized the care uh, becomes, the more uh, nuanced the physical examination or the diagnostic assessment, uh, the less likely telehealth is going to be able to meet the need of connecting physician to patient. Um, where we know it's going to have the, the greatest opportunity to expand and truly become a fir virtual first option is in this area of primary care um, and, and solving for some of the use cases we saw in the previous slide. So I, I, I think we'll, we'll see the greatest utilization of telehealth with generalists. Um, I will say that outside of the data from this survey, we're also uh, seeing and, and hearing a lot of confirmation from our customers and, and other resources. Uh, data, uh, that behavioral health is also another area where we will see um, a, a continued growth and expansion of telehealth, uh, again, because physical assessment is rarely uh, required in those cases, and patients seem to be uh, very comfortable uh, through COVID, um, for, you know, having their uh, counseling and behavioral health sessions conducted virtually. Um, there's some security there. Uh, there's a connectedness through that virtual collaboration capability and also some security uh, for patients who feel more comfortable sharing that way. So we're seeing that expansion as well. But general health, uh, generalists or um, primary care family practice, that's where we've, we, we will likely see um, telehealth take a, take a foothold and continue to expand. Mm -hmm. 
So for the, for the majority of respondents, so reimbursement unknowns are a telehealth concern post-pandemic, and that's followed by integration with EHRs, workflows, and patient access. So the survey was conducted in November, but the latest $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief bill that was recently signed you know, includes a number of provisions aimed at expanding health IT. So you know, it's not reimbursement per se, but it does support telehealth infrastructure, which could impact and support EHR integration and workflows and patient access. So with this in mind, Leah, you know, with these concerns at the forefront of um, providers' minds, how should decision makers build out their post-pandemic strategies for telehealth you know, with regard to uncertainty about reimbursements, you know, EHR integration work and workflows, and patient access? Yeah, I think reimbursement is going to be critical here. Even with the funding that the FCC provided under the COVID uh, relief bill, which did help a, a, a great many uh, health systems and hospitals and clinics um, and, and provider groups uh, get some telehealth capabilities uh, deployed. That's a once and done um, grant offering. It's certainly not something that can sustain telehealth um, you know, cost and, and deployment over the long term. So reimbursement is going to be critical to that long-term picture for most of those organizations. They're, they're going to need to see some parity between the, what they're able to bill for for an on-site visit versus what they can bill for for a virtual visit in order for that to be uh, able to deliver an ROI over, over a long term. I, I do know that there, uh, the FCC is looking at, you know, potentially another round of that funding to go out, so that's good news. And there's other um, pilot projects and programs through the FCC for funding for telehealth that are very tied, um, in most cases, to being able to um, submit a use case or prove, prove out a uh, proof of concept around how to meet a digital divide need. So a lot of that grant funding is really around special needs um, communities or high need communities and those that have uh, d disparate access to care. So there are some, even some barriers and boundaries around some of that funding. So again, I think, um, I think for long-term ROI, uh, regardless of funding sources, Reimbursement is still going to be the greatest driver of whether or not we see this expand and whether we hear our physician and provider and health system customers say, yes, we're seeing an ROI out of that. Um, and, and certainly the 59% who, who indicated reimbursement unknowns as their top concern, I think that's a reflection on we're all waiting to see. Um, and I think there'll be a collective exhale uh, of relief across, <laughs> across the industry when when we can see some um, some movement there, you know these uh, CMS um, provisions made permanent and then also expanded to include different visit types, uh, links of links of contact, and um, who can bill for those visits um, across the spectrum of clinical caregivers. So uh, I think it's a wait and see, but I do think it's the biggest concern for most right now. All right, that makes sense. So when we look at the top three pain points with telehealth in the future post-pandemic, we see differences among job roles and organization size. So integration with EHR workflows is higher for executive and administrative uh, roles and IT tech roles than clinicians. So that's 51% versus 24% for clinicians. So Leah, this is surprising to me because a more efficient workflow is really important to clinicians. But what does this tell us about telehealth platforms integrating more easily with EHRs and making workflows more efficient when healthcare organizations are looking to bolster their telehealth platforms? Yeah, I think the fact that um, integration is a higher priority to executives than to those in the IT leadership suite is not surprising. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones typically um, making the decisions, budgetary decisions around big system integrations and the way all of that is stitching together across their digital transformation roadmap. Uh, so anywhere that they're investing in a new technology that needs to be integrated into their current stack of solutions, they're looking for synergy. They're looking for ROI. Um, they want to make sure that interoperability means cost savings. It means uh, operational efficiency uh, and ultimately better care outcomes. But for clinicians, they're typically focused on some of these things like diagnostic error rate. Of course, they would be. They're clinicians. Um, they are 
less likely to be focused depending on where they sit in the decision-making picture. If we're talking about a clinical practice that's different, of course, than a hospital or health system uh, differentiator here. But I think, um, and it's not that clinicians don't care about whether there's interoperability, but they're always going to be focused more on patient outcomes and whether or not those tools and platforms and solutions, whether integrated well and interoperable or not, are actually driving um, better care, better care outcomes, more transparency uh, around um, care decisions. Uh, is it supporting uh, continuity of care and coordination of care? Um, and if all of those things are true, usually clinicians are pretty happy. But the administrators, the IT level folks, they're, they're looking at that inter interoperability integration with the HR systems because they've made a big investment in those, right? They want to see an ROI. And they know that um, you know, on paper and um, statistically, they're going to get a better ROI from those systems when they're well integrated and there's seamless interoperability across their systems. So I don't think this is surprising. I just think it's a matter of, you know, where you sit in the, um, in, in the organization and what you're charged with and what, you know, keeps you up at night, what you're most mindful of. And we would expect to see uh, different answers depending on where you sit in the organization. Okay, great. And so respondents were asked to rank their top five must-haves for a telehealth video conferencing provider post-pandemic. And the top five were ease of use for provider and patient, the ability to work across a wide variety of patient or provider devices, easy integration into current workflows and interfaces, privacy and security and HIPAA compliancy, and cost efficiency. So these are core functionalities that telehealth providers have to have, right, Leah? But let's look at the potential differentiators. So if the core functionalities are table stakes, how might those next capabilities impact how healthcare provider decision makers approach their telehealth offerings post-pandemic? Yeah, I think, too, that, that kind of jump out to me is if 80% said, you know, the core functionality that the platform needs to be easy to use for providers and patients, one of the things that can drive that is that second one in your middle box, no app download needed. So the easier it is um, for the patient to get in and out of the technology, the better it's going to drive that patient satisfaction and engagement that they're really going for on that far left. So as you look at some of these technical capabilities, it's going to be, and some of them are simple, you know, the ability to, to um, inter integrate or, um, it, you know, create interoperability with an EHR system is a complex proposition. It can be done, and certainly, you know, telehealth platform providers, including us, we, we're developing those capabilities. We know that's important to our customers. But something as simple as saying we're able to get your patient in and out <laughs> without having to download an app, without complexity. We provide them a link. They click it. They're in the visit. That's pretty powerful, and that's going to be a great driver uh, of that far left 80% priority number where they're telling us, yes, we'd like it to be interoperable. We want those bells and whistles too, but if, if, we, if we had to prioritize them, it's the most important thing uh, that the platform is easy to use for our patients. So uh, anything that's, you know, around automatic reminders, scheduling, all of the things that are wrapped around that telehealth visit, the more seamless you can make that, the more you can replicate an inpatient visit um, and, and, and create that credible sense of quality and connectedness that a patient is used to when they come into your office. Um, again, all of that is going to drive uh, patient utilization and adoption, patient engagement, and, and, and long term, you know, from a care outcome perspective, which is what clinicians really care about, does this enable me to sustain a connected conversation with my patient that translates into um, care compliance and medication adherence and, and having patients that don't um, disappear off my radar and I don't, don't have the ability to see or know or connect to how they're doing or whether they're, they're following their care and treatment programs. All of that connects together in terms of continuity of care, and those are things we know are most important to the clinician and ultimately drive all of their ROI around platform engagement. Great. So our research revealed that leaders at small organizations place a higher priority on privacy and security and cost efficiency than those at large organizations. So, you know, again, to your point, you know, security is table stakes, so this is a core functionality, but small organizations see these as challenges for them. They do, yeah. I mean, they have limited budgets around, you know, to, to – um, 
to continue to build out a security stack that um, provides them with assurances around um, intrusion and breach. And so it's top of mind. I do think it's top of mind for all CISOs and, and IS folks, regardless of size of organization, but it certainly would be uh, a more pressing concern for smaller organizations who don't have the budget to, to put big uh, threat detection and, and network monitoring type of solutions in. So they have to be even um, more cautious and they would have gr even greater concerns that the platforms they are integrating like telehealth come right out of the box with um, compliance support assurances um, that they need from end to end. Great. So our research revealed two differences in devices, device usage among the size of healthcare organizations. So clinicians at large organizations are more likely to use the EHR, whereas small clinicians, whereas clinicians at small organizations tend to use their own app. So depending upon the size of their organization, Leah, what do decision makers need to consider with regard to telehealth platform or technology in order for patients and providers to have a user-friendly, patient-centric experience? Yeah, I think the variability here just speaks to the fact that there's there can't be um, you know a limited point of entry either on the clinician side or the patient side. The more you can make the experience omni-channel on both sides of the visit, uh, and the more options that both the provider and the patient have for joining the visit and conducting the visit. Um, the device becomes less important than the fact that you've set up the, the platform with the flexibility um, to, to establish that visit across an omni-channel ecosystem of devices. They have the option to choose, and they're not limited by um, device or access points to get into the visit. I think that's the most important um, data point you know, out of this slide for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. So I want to reiterate and highlight again, uh, you know, the key takeaways, uh, the three traits for success, you know, which are, again, that you need technology that's easy to use, that's user friendly. You know, there's an element of patient centricity and that, of course, interoperability is really important. So thank you, Leah, for your time and for Blue Jeans by, by Verizon as our sponsor. And now I'd like to introduce to you Danielle Preisler. Senior Product Manager at Blue Jeans by Verizon, who will discuss how Blue Jeans by Verizon is using these insights to develop the concepts around its new telehealth offerings. Danielle? All right. Thanks, Patty. Appreciate it. So uh, before we dive in to the new Blue Jeans telehealth platform that we're launching, I wanted to just give a little bit of background on Blue Jeans overall for those who aren't as familiar with us. So BlueJeans has been around since 2009. Um, its core business has really been around providing cloud-based video meetings and events with enterprise grade security, performance, manageability, and scalability for various types of organizations. And prior to developing our purpose-built telehealth solution that I'm gonna talk about, BlueJeans had already been providing telehealth services to quite a wide variety of um, healthcare organizations and actually conducted millions of televisits during the pandemic, which really helped to keep the patient staff and providers safe while still being able to provide um, that top quality care. And worth noting too, with BlueJeans now as a part of Verizon, together we, we really have that deep knowledge and the high quality infrastructure to deliver this industry leading connectivity video and audio to all of our customers. And in particular, we're speaking today to our healthcare customers. So, Diving into telehealth a little further. Um, as we've seen in earlier parts of this webinar and what Patty and Leah have spoke to, um, as well as feedback we've gathered from our customers and advisory groups, um, this ease of use is really a top driver when it comes to telehealth. And traditionally, telemedicine has been inherently difficult, like we said, for patients and oftentimes providers even to use. And that is really, that consequently results in a, a lack of positive care outcomes. And from an experience perspective, I think it's really important to look at how we break down a telehealth encounter. So we look at it from this pre-visit, in-visit, and post-visit stages. And in each of these areas, there are various different pain points of the user experience. And those are what we really analyzed and looked to solve when we were developing the BlueJeans telehealth platform. So as I walk through these features with you, you'll see how we prioritize ease of use in each of these stages of a telehealth visit or encounter. 
So the solution that we're launching this week, BlueJeans Telehealth, has really been designed and built to reimagine that user experience. So in turn, helping to drive those improved uh, patient outcomes. And we've created this simple, smart, and trusted way uh, for providers to meet with patients as well as collaborate with peers over video conferencing. And this, the platform is built on the existing trusted BlueJeans Meetings Foundation and we've really equipped the BlueJeans Telehealth platform with those purpose-built features and functionality uh, to provide that quick access and ease of use when joining a televisit. I'm um, really mapping to clinical team workflows to help replicate uh, those on-site care encounters and the patient interactions for those providers. Um, also EHR interoperability to further support those provider workflows um, and scheduling as well within the EHR and also some interpreter service integration to assist with language barriers, which is another really important aspect. Um, so this launch and this initial feature set that we are launching this week is part of this a larger roadmap of you know, really data-driven features that we are building uh, with the continued focus on that patient and provider experience support that we think is such an important aspect of any uh, telehealth program. So, I want to just quickly look at each of these areas of um, a telehealth experience a little closer. So in a nutshell, from a pre-visit experience, we've really looked to simplify. It's really the main focus. And what that means to us starts with joining how you want with what device you're comfortable with. So whether that be for patients or providers. So they have the ability to join on a desktop or a mobile device, as well as via a, the Blue Jeans, the native BlueJeans app, or via WebRTC or mobile WebRTC, which really is that no downloads required. Click the link and it puts you straight into the meeting. So once a patient has joined from whatever device that they, they wanted to use, we've really reimagined this patient landing experience and waiting room experience to emulate, and we're really working to emulate that experience you would have with an in-person visit. So that includes a check-in process, symptom gathering, uh, and a waiting room where patients can view uploaded articles and videos while they wait that the provider um, has given or put in there. So from the provider side, utilizing our Epic integration, uh, providers can see with, from within their, their provider portal when a patient has joined the call. And what that really does is reduce any wasted time and increases efficiency for these providers who are, as you know, most you know, increasingly busy with less time in between uh, these appointments or visits. So that's, that was a really important um, aspect from the in-person, I mean, sorry, the in-visit stage that we wanted to uh, address. So uh, back to the in-person uh, perspective, BlueJeans has always placed a really strong value on high-quality audio and uh, high-quality video. And it's, it's really no different when looking at telehealth. High-quality video and audio are real necessities for any positive telehealth outcome. So within a visit, uh, we're also allowing users to surface and share relevant information with their provider from directly within their televisit. Um, so that would include symptom information from the check-in screen that is then shared with the provider uh, within a pop-out chat screen, um, screen share sharing capability for documentation or image sharing. And we're also taking advantage of what people may think of as more traditional collaboration tools to really help enhance a televisit like whiteboarding and uh, annotation functionality. Uh, lastly, from within an in-visit perspective, uh, for language barriers, uh, we're providing integration with industry-leading interpreter services to really allow for direct connection with an interpreter um, from right within the televisit. So a click-to-connect functionality, which we think is really important uh, for enhancing that efficiency as well. So when we're looking at post-visit functionality, I think there are a few areas that I think are worth, that really worth highlighting. From a pricing perspective, we've structured the pricing of the BlueJeans Telehealth platform to be flexible. So we're offering both a named host licensing model that many organizations are familiar with. And if people are familiar with BlueJeans, it's a very common uh, licensing model from within uh, BlueJeans meetings. But we're also introducing a per-visit model and what this does is it really allows for an easier apples to apples comparison um, with how healthcare encounters are built and reimbursed for today. So that, that, that was an important aspect to really include those dual types of uh, pricing models to best fit various different types of healthcare organizations. 
Um, second, our EHR integration also delivers call information back to the EHR system, which really helps with um, the, that billing and records as well um, when they are uh, going, you know, handling the billing aspects of their telehealth programs. Um, we have various scheduling options for administrators as well, including delegate scheduling and um, from within the BlueJeans scheduler, along with direct scheduling capabilities from within an organization's uh, EHR scheduling portal. So various, op various options dependent on how um, an organization wants to handle scheduling of these televisits. And uh, lastly, but I think quite important, is reporting and analytics are are just another integral part of the puzzle when we're looking at healthcare organizations as a whole. And I think and you being able to report on telehealth programs is increasingly becoming more important in order to justify the expense um, and, and really justify the overall program as it's being built up and expanded for most organizations. So we try to make that easier with our command center reporting and analytics functionality. So healthcare organizations are really able to see both at a high level as well a more granular level information about their telehealth usage and their overall telehealth program that they're that they're do that they're utilizing and lastly uh, as we're wrapping this up i think it's always important to speak to security and hipaa um, readiness and i and leah and patty had spoke to that the importance of the security side of the house and blue jeans has always put a strong and proactive emphasis on security and we really think it's incredibly important for any healthcare organization to invest in a telehealth service that has done their due diligence and really has a strong track record of putting security at the forefront of their platform. And BlueJeans by Verizon has always kept that focus and implemented the necessary measures. And we've continued to do that to ensure that healthcare organizations in particular have that peace of mind when deploying our telehealth platform. So with, you know, whether that being you know, extensive third-party reviews, uh, multiple HIPAA readiness assessments, and also industry-leading data encryption. So overall, you know, that was a brief overview. Um, if you're curious to learn more, I, feel free to contact us or uh, visit our telehealth page um, at bluejeans.com. And Martina, if you want to wrap things up, that would be great. Thank you very much, Danielle. And thanks, Patty and Leah, for a great presentation and lots of great insights from everybody. I'd just like to remind our audience to complete the exit survey that will appear on your screen shortly. Thank you again to our presenters and to BlueJeans by Verizon for sponsoring today's webinar. Thanks for everybody for joining.